Hello everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video and in today's Kerbal Space Program video, well, whilst I was trying to come up with a idea for today's Kerbal Space Program video, my mind it drifted back to an SSTO I made quite some time ago. I feel like this is like 2016 or 2017, so uh, a long, long time ago by internet standards. And I remember building this SSTO purely for... Uh, I guess purely for looks, but also it would have some functionality. It had like the science equipment on board. I kind of built an SSTO as like a cool thing that might get built in real life. Like how humans might build an interplanetary SSTO if our solar system was as easy as a Kerbal Space Program. So it's got lots of cockpits on board. So we've, got, we've got two cockpits at the front with loads and loads of like instrumentations, computers, navigational equipment. And that Mark II inline cockpit has got two floors. So there's lots of space to move around. It's also got a passenger bay as well. So there's lots of space for like living quarters. That passenger bay just behind the Mark II uh, inline cockpit could have like a kitchenette and bedrooms and stuff in it and then behind that it has like a science lab in the form of a cargo bay with all the scientific equipment that sort of stuff and it would fly to Juna and it could be be a really cool mission and the SSTO just didn't really work very well like it flew terribly and it didn't really have enough delta v to do anything other than minmus and I don't know I just never really was never really satisfied with it and I never really wanted to showcase it because I'm like ah it could do with some work, maybe I'll try and refine it and showcase it sometime in the future. And today is the future, and I thought, you know what, I remember that SSTO. I really liked how it all came together, like the general aesthetic of the, you know, of the uh, the front Mark II cockpit, uh, followed by the Mark II inline cockpit behind it, and it, I think it just looked really, really nice. And I think I'd like, I'd like to, I'd like to do it again. Gosh darn it! But this time, do it properly. So this is kind of like I don't have any photos, or I guess a screenshot to be a better word to use of the vessel I built, but I, I had a sort of a vague recollection of. How how it seemed to appear so uh, that's kind of what i used to build this thing really and this is it actually in the uh, actually in the space plane hangar they're pretty much done not much else needs doing and i thought to myself you know what now it's done let's just take this thing to the mun because i really like visiting the mun it's a really good balance of just difficult enough to do in an SSTO where it's still quite impressive to watch someone do it. And uh, also, it's not a huge uh, commute from low Kerbin orbit to the Mun, so the video isn't sort of filled with this big uh, space where you're just travelling through interplanetary space, which takes up quite a bit of time. So, keeps the video nice and punchy and on point. And, uh, and I've still got the Games Links Parallax mod installed that I showcased last week, and the Mun looked phenomenal in that mod. Well, I, I said every celestial body looks phenomenal in that mod, but the Mun in particular, I thought, looked especially gorgeous. So I'll take any excuse I can get to uh, re-showcase uh, the surface of the Mun with the Parallax mod installed uh, as we crossfade across to uh, our takeoff. Now, I did say that my uh, head cannon for how this thing would be laid out would be, you know, you'd have maybe a crew of four, two in the front cockpit, two in the uh, posterior cockpit, and then the back um, inline passenger bay uh, would be where they'd sleep, eat, dine. Well, it could be the multifunctional room. Didn't really get far enough to designate specific roles for each compartment, but you get the idea. But for this bit, I thought, you know what? We've got space for lots of Kerbals. Let's just fill it with lots of Kerbals. It's not going to be a particularly long uh, journey. We're only going to the Mun and back. Uh, so we don't need to be spending years and years in interplanetary space. If we were, I might have considered reducing the crew down to, you know, four or even two, maybe three, if I was feeling really, really wild. Here we are beginning our ascent. Uh, the ascent is really uh, nothing too uh, outlandish. I'm just holding a fairly, uh, fairly conservative angle of attack between 10 and 20 degrees on the nav ball because this strikes a really good balance for uh, accelerating but also gaining altitude. The rapiers are pretty weedy engines until you get past the... Uh, around the 450 meter per second mark so we need to make sure we get to that speed fairly quickly and as you can see if you watch our surface velocity once we've passed that velocity which of course we now have you'll see that our speed suddenly starts accelerating uh, exponentially like the acceleration is much much faster once we reach that uh, initial 450 meter per second barrier once we reach 10 kilometers above the surface which again we've, we've now done uh, i'm going to start flying pretty much flat to try and gain as much 
uh, horizontal speed as possible. At the end of the day, horizontal speed is what's going to keep us in orbit. And at the moment, we're burning with our engines in their most efficient state. That is, uh, the rape is burning in air breathing mode as we ascend into the upper atmosphere where there is very little oxygen present. We'd have to rely a bit more heavily on the less efficient chemical rocket engines, those being the nuclear engines and, of course, the rapier engines in their closed cycle fire mode. Speaking of that, here we are. The rapier engines are now in their inefficient but very powerful closed cycle mode. They are now draining the oxidizer from our fuel tanks. You can watch that rapidly depleting in the fuel gauge at the top right hand corner of the screen. Just before our oxidizer runs out though, I'm going to just quickly cut those engines off. Uh, I like to try and have at least, I don't know, between 100 and 150 units of oxidizer remaining for these sorts of missions just because it's really helpful to have that extra bit of oxidizer to give you a bit of extra thrust when departing from the surface of a planet or moon such as the Mun, uh, where we haven't got any air to, to uh, provide any lift for this thing. So it really helps to have a high thrust engine just to kick yourself off the ground uh, nice and quickly. So that's what that extra little bit of oxidizer is left over for. I also have a drain valve on this thing just in case I managed to do my ascent really really efficiently and I didn't need anywhere near the amount of oxidizer I had. I didn't want to be stuck in orbit with like 500 units of oxidizer left in the tanks because then that just adds more mass to the craft and thereby reducing the efficiency of our nuclear engines which of course only need the liquid fuel to function. So the fuel, t the drainage tank or whatever it's called, the fuel valve, uh, the fuel valve is there to basically drain any surplus oxidizer you might have after your ascent. But in this case, I had just the right amount, so it was all fine. And then I transferred all the oxidizer into one central tank. This just makes it easier to toggle oxidizer on and off. Like, just tick the little box next to the oxidizer on that tank to disable it. That way, if I accidentally activate the rapier engines, like I press the wrong action group or stage or something like that, I won't accidentally turn on the rapiers and drain our remaining oxidizer and also mess up whatever orbit we were on uh, by manually disabling the oxidizer source by moving it all into one tank. Uh, it makes it a bit easier just to avoid any mishaps, which of course are a, a frequent thing for most Kerbal missions. Anyway, here we are conducting our burn towards the Mun. Uh, it was a fairly long burn. We only have two nuclear engines and our um, ship's mass is relatively high. So we don't have a great thrust weight ratio. Luckily, it is high enough to do a Mun landing. So we don't have to worry about that, guys. I mean, obviously, I guess I've set the precedent now where if this plane didn't work, I wouldn't be making a video of it. So there isn't really that much suspense for you guys, but I can artificially create some anyway in order to earn your little likes down below. Hey, if you are enjoying this video, then do consider liking the video. It really, really does help. And hey, if you're not subscribed, I make these videos every Saturday. So you can subscribe and then you can see them, I, I'm, I'm told. I'm also told that that doesn't happen at all on YouTube these days, so who can really say for sure? Anyway, uh, as you can see, we've got all of our science in that little cargo bay just there. And we also have a s experiment storage box or compartment. I don't know what it's called. That little white box just there. That way, rather than having a Kerbal have to go to every experiment and have you right click and press take data, you can just have that thing in there and then have an action group to just move all the experiment data straight to that box. And it just makes it much easier to gather the science. I've put a little seat there for our Kerbal though, just so that you know it makes it easier to restore the mystery goo and science junior units because unlike all the other experiments we have on board this thing, uh, those are single use provided you have unless you have a scientist Kerbal to can who can reset them but you need to actually manually do that manually do that with the Kerbal next to the experiments that's why I've got that little seat there just to reduce the amount of time it takes to uh, you know restore those experiments as we do our little science trip because you know I said from the get-go that this is going to be a scientific plane above all else so it would be weird for me to not showcase its scientific capabilities that's what I got here. Now I've got all of the science uh, units set to action group uh, six, I think, except for the magnetometer boom. Uh, that's set to a separate action group. The reason for this is because when it runs the experiment, it expands. It's very long, basically. And that means that because it's mounted to the underside of the craft, when we're landed, if we extend it, it's just going to hit the surface and potentially break. And when we're on the surface, I need to run all the scientific experiments again, but I don't need to run the magnetometer boom because it doesn't work when you're landed. So that's why the magnetometer boom, magnetometer boom is bound to a separate action group. Uh, it's because we don't need to use it when we're landed. And if we did use it when we're landed, uh, it might break things. Although I don't think it can physically deploy at all when you're landed. Or maybe you can like 
force it to deploy by right clicking it and press extend. I don't really know, it's a fairly recent part, right? So I haven't really experimented with it all that much. Was that a pun? Experimented with the experiment? Who knows? Anyway, we've now got all the science we're going to get for a while now. Uh, we've got it from, I think I've got it from low Kerbin orbit, or space near Kerbin I should say, space high above Kerbin, space high above the moon, and space uh, near to the moon. So the next time we're going to be doing science experiments is going to be when we're landed, so it'll be safer for everyone if that Kerbal is back on board the craft as we prepare to execute our surface burn. Now, there isn't really a big secret to this, guys. This was basically all trial and error. Uh, I want to try and do a suicide burn because it's always good practice to try and do things as efficiently as possible, and suicide burns are the most efficient way of landing in Kerbal Space Program. For those that don't know, a suicide burn is when you just uh, set your th engines to max throttle, and it's just one continuous burn, and then you kill off all your speed right as you touch down. Obviously, it's very risky, hence the name Suicide Burn, but if you can pull it off, then um, it's more efficient. And uh, as you can see, it, it worked pretty well. And I was saying earlier that there isn't really a big trick to it. The reason I said that is because I basically made a quick save and then just sort of guessed when I would need to start my Suicide Burn. And uh, if I messed it up, I would just reload a, a quick save. I would reload the quick save and uh, try again at a slightly higher or lower altitude, depending on how successful or unsuccessful the Suicide Burn was. I feel like that was a horrible sentence, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, because as you can see, we have touched down on the surface. I'm just rolling to get to a slightly flatter part of this crater just here, which means we are going to be crashing into that boulder ahead of us. But don't worry, it's uh, it's not a solid entity, so we don't have to worry about hitting it. I guess if I'm trying to be realistic, it's probably not a very good maneuver, because there's no way this thing could just... Well, it's physically impossible to clip through a rock like that. But I just wanted to get to the... Uh, the bottom of this canyon to stabilize it, make some, make for a prettier environment for our photographs, make it a bit easier to perform our EVA antics, and of course make it a bit easier to access the uh, undercarriage, well, you know, the um, the cargo bay on the bottom of the craft. I don't really know why I mounted the cargo bay to, bot to the bottom of the craft, now I think about it, it would probably have been easier to mount it to the top than I wouldn't have had to, uh, you know, bind the little magnetometer boom to a separate action group, but, uh, oh, I remember now, actually! Oh! I didn't even talk about it when I used this feature, but I put some monopropellant engines inside. This is terrible. Most Kerbal Space Program YouTubers like script their videos. I'm so I'm sorry, guys. Uh, but no, I, I put some monopropellant engines. I remember now in that cargo bay and um, to help kind of keep the nose up when performing our takeoffs and I guess uh, landings on planets with no atmosphere or moons with no atmosphere, such as uh, the Moon. Um, I think I should probably probably have added uh, some more engines. I forgot just how weak those engines were. I think whenever I've done this in the past, I've used the Verna engines, I think, which are the ones that are like RCS ports, but they use liquid fuel and oxidizer. And those have higher thrust than those place anywhere RCS blocks. So, you know, potential improvement. If you do download the craft file from the description, you could beef those engines up a bit. And, you know, that brings me to a little topic, actually. Uh, people say, oh Matt, you know, you always make your craft files available in the description, but then in the video you always inevitably say, hey, you can change something on the craft to make it better. Why don't you just change it before you upload it? And two reasons, guys. First of all, I'm very lazy and I can't be bothered to do that. But secondly, and this is the main reason actually, truth be told, is because I don't really like sharing my craft files in the description. I, I think it's good for transparency and also because sometimes it's nice to see how crafts work or, you know, kind of gain an understanding of how they're built by reverse engineering them from the original craft file. But at the same time, I think it's good to practice more on your own, like get more familiar with the various building tools like the offset tool and the rotation tool in the vehicle assembly building and space plane hangar and, you know, get familiar with how the parts clip together and ultimately, I think of KSP as being a creative tool, and uh, for me, it's a game of two parts, really. Half the game is the designing of craft in the space plane hangar and vehicle assembly building, you know, getting the aesthetics nice and making sure everything works and setting up the action groups, and I think it really takes, away, uh, takes something away from the game when all that is done by just downloading a craft file. So I would really encourage you guys to, um, you know, try and just build this yourself, from the video rather than download the craft file um, so you can kind of make your own changes as you go along and you'll get something that's a bit more unique to you uh, which kind of brings me back to what I was to what I started talking about which was you know why don't you just make the edits before you upload the craft file and that's why 
Now you could you could do something. <laughs> it gets yourself better at the game. Like, say, okay, right. So Matt suggested that I need to increase or beef up these, um, you know, uh, underside engines. What engines can I use? Then you start looking at the engines, looking at their, you know, their thrust to weight ratio, seeing what fuels they use. If they don't use monopellant, then you can get rid of all the extra monopellant tanks on this craft, and you can start doing a little bit of building for yourself, but not completely engineering the thing from the ground up. And that is why. And also because I'm very lazy, as I said. And it, really, this is all just justification of that, to be honest. Anyway, there is the man. I feel like I didn't talk about the amazing graphics mod. Hopefully, it did all the talking for me. If you're not quite sure what I'm on about, it's that ground tessellation effect. You know how the ground looked really, really rugged and bumpy with lots of stones? That's the mod. That's tessellation. It kind of adds that little undulation to the surface and all the little, uh, you know, lighting effects and shadows and stuff that come with that. And uh, yeah, there's, I, I'll put a card on screen if I remember to the actual video where I properly showcased that video but you know in that video I did a man landing and then I did a minmus landing and I didn't plan on doing a minmus landing in this video but then I saw how much delta V I had left and I'm like hey we've got like over a kilometer per second of fuel left we easily have enough to do a cheeky little minmus landing before we go back to the Kerbal Space Center so hey what a twist! And so you might have been wondering at this point, why is this video so long? We've now ascended from the Mun. All that's left is to go back to the Kerbal Space Center and haha! You have been bamboozled, my friend! I overshot the bird just here. Uh, we're going to do a cheeky little Minmus landing, because why not? I really like going to Minmus. It's actually, I say this every time I go there, to be fair. So this is probably not news to anyone at this point, but it's uh, unironically one of my favourite places in Kerbal Space Program to visit. It's just so pretty. And it's very, very pretty with Games Links' Parallax mod. And I don't, I don't know which update this was. Or if this is actually one of the graphics mods I'm using now, think about it. I've got quite a few. I've got environmental visual enhancements. I've got scatterer. I've got, I think I've got planet. No, I don't think I've got. I don't think I've got planet shine installed at the moment. I always forget because I'm always updating uh, what graphics mods I've got installed. And I think I did a massive overhaul for Into the Warp, my little Kerbal Space Program film. That's you know, and uh, and I, I I just did so many custom things for that. that I really don't even know what I'm running anymore. Uh, people always ask me what graphics mods do you use, and I'm like, to be honest. What I'm running is probably not optimal. Just Google or go, you know, go on Reddit. Actually, no, Google what you want, followed by the word Reddit. That's better than the Reddit search feature. Just Google, like, you know, how to make KSP look really, really good. There'll be some great guys there who will just either they've written a post, you know, telling you how to do it, or go on a, on a subreddit like Kerbal Academy or whatever and just say, what graphics mod would you recommend using? Or you could go to my Discord server, a link to which is in the video description. And I'm sure the kind folks there will, uh, you know, help you out with all the graphics mods questions you require. So there we are. What I'm doing is I'm basically offloading all responsibility from myself uh, because that's the kind of content creator I am. Give me money on Patreon at patreon.com slash man. No, I'm, I'm only messing with you guys. Although, actually, unironically, I do, I do have a Patreon, and I'm very grateful for everyone that donates to it, but I don't like plugging it too much because, I don't know, I, I, I don't want to, like, divide my viewers based on exclusive content. That's why I don't really do any pa uh, Patreon uh, exclusive content, really. Like, I don't really do any Patreon videos because, I, I don't know, I, I, I've been poor, and I couldn't afford to donate to one. I don't think Patreon was even a thing when I was a student, but, uh, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't be able to afford it. And I don't like, I don't really want to lock off content to people that, you know, can't afford to support me monetarily. So that's, um, I don't really know why I was on this tangent, really. I think, um, that, oh, I forgot. I was, sta I started talking about something about how nice Minmus looks. And I got sidetracked once again in this video. But uh, as I said, I don't know if it was a graphics mod that I've got or if it's a recent update. But Minmus now has this, like, it's not an atmosphere, but there's, like, dust or like fog or something at its surface, it's like got a blue hue to it. And it looks amazing, it looks beautiful. So, um, I don't know, if this was a graphics mod, kudos to you, unknown mod maker. If it was an update with KSP, then it was great. Uh, and speaking of great things, look at this, it's the Great Flats, I, I think. Is this the Great Flats or is this the, uh... oh no, it it's, the it's the Lesser Flats, it's the Lesser Flats, but hey, 
What a great segue that would have been, eh? And here we are, touching down on the lesser flats. I'm trying to be, like, really precise about it and not let our tail fins uh, touch the surface because that would probably be quite bad for our fragile little space plane. So I'm just trying to, you know, keep ourselves as low to the ground as possible without actually touching the surface. I'm now just trying to draw your t attention away from the fact that I didn't do that on the mun and I just let the tail fins hit the surface. But Bimbus, you know, it's easier. Uh, our terrible thrust weight ratio is less of a bad inhibiting factor so uh, it's much easier to do and there we are and as you can see once again the minimus lesser flats have received the tessellation treatment from games links's amazing tessellation mod cannot recommend it. Ugh, ooh, ooh. i cannot recommend this mod enough so much so that it, it makes me choke up apparently when i try and say the name of it and uh yeah i don't want to I, I, I i'm aware that this video is starting to uh become quite long so i'm not going to get all of our kerbals on eva again because it's, it's going to be in a lot of time. And you've already seen me do that on the man. So we're just going to get Bob Kerman here to uh, restore our mystery goo containment unit and our science junior experiment bay. So we can run some science experiments from the surface of the Minmus Lesser Flats. And of course, you can do the most important part of this mission, which is, of course, planting the flag. Past Matt, what are you doing? I think. <laughs> okay. Hey, fun fact, by the way, guys, uh, this was actually take two of this mission. I'd forgotten what I do when I'm populating craft where I just intend to fill up every single uh, cargo bay or no, passenger bay and cockpit to its maximum capacity is I don't really look at it in the vehicle assembly building, you know, where you just select the crew. I just press tick, 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 tick and let them all just auto populate all of the crew cabins. But I'd forgotten that you can now, you know, populate EVA seats from the vehicle assembly building. So which meant that uh, a, a Kerbal spawned on that little exterior seat uh, when I launched this craft. But because it's on the underside of the craft, I didn't realise this until I'd got into low Kerb in orbit. And I panned the camera around to get some nice cinematic shots, and I just saw a little Kerbal face clip through the passenger bay doors, and I was like, oh, great. So I just, I mean, I guess what I did consider putting the Kerbal on EVA and just having him EVA over to the nearest space station, but that would have added quite a bit of time to the video, and I felt that, oh, I don't know, maybe I could have just time-lapsed it. I was very late. I don't know. I've got no reason for it. Um, that was just something funny that happened to me. So if make sure if you do what I do and you just auto-populate stuff as fast as you can, um, make sure you've not put a Kerbal on that EVA seat. Unless you don't care that there's an extra Kerbal with his helmet clipping through the, mar the cargo bay doors. Yeah. Anyway... <laughs> I don't know what that was. Here we are ascending from Minmus, uh, making sure that there is. I did notice there was a little hill in front of us, but do not worry, guys. We're going to clear that hill with loads and loads of room to spare. Uh, we're not going to crash into it, and it's all going to be fine. I think. Oh, oh you could park a bus in that gap, mate. Don't worry. <laughs> That's why, for anyone, if anyone even noticed this, but whenever I've had a Kerbal in that EVA seat, I've always made sure that the cargo bay doors remain open, because if you were to close them, whilst it wouldn't matter, because they won't kill the Kerbal or anything, they would still clip through the Kerbal's head and it would look a bit weird. So whenever there's a Kerbal in that seat, I've always made sure to keep the cargo bay doors open. Uh, and there we are. Now we're in the air. We can extend that Magneto Beta Boom and form some science from space near Minmus. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm like trying to maximize the amount of science I'm getting from this mission by running all the experiments at each sort of uh, key point. Is that a good term? <laughs> at each key point in the mission. Another nice safe terrain pass just coming up here, by the way. But yes, I've tried to maximize the amount of science we get from this mission, but I am mindful that this is my Laun Aerospace save, where I've been doing a lot of science missions for over a year now, so we already have most of the science from Mun and Minmus. So, you know, if you did this mission yourself, if you download the craft file in the description, like I said, um, you know, you might get a lot more science than I do uh, from this mission. I won't spoil how much science we eventually unlock, but uh, I, it's a fair amount considering that I've pretty much exhausted all the science from Mun and Minmus so far. I mean, I haven't done, I don't think I've done any missions to the Mun and Minmus with the magnetometer boom arm, so that's doing most of the heavy lifting when it comes to getting all the big science points. And I guess I could have gone a little bit further and put a uh, scanning arm inside that cargo bay and then just roll the SSTO towards surface features to scan them, but that's a bit excessive. And then we are, I don't know, it's not really what I wanted from this craft, really. I mean, it would be nice if you could have, like, an electric motor for the uh, the landing gear for these craft. I know that's not particularly realistic, but neither is the rapier engine when you think about it. I mean, I know it's based on the Skylon um, 
what's it called? The Sabre engine, but it's not a real engine, and I'm sure at some point it has been hypothesized to electrify uh, airplane landing wheels, if it's not already been done. I don't know enough about the subject to dispute it. And that would be a nice feature, maybe. I don't know what I'm trying to say here, really. I think I'm just trying to buy some time until we get to the next part of the mission that warrants me talking about that part of the mission. What a great sentence that was. By the way, look at Mimus. Does it not look beautiful, guys? This is, once again, the surface uh, textures that come with the Games Link's Tessellation mod or Parallax mod. I keep calling it the Tessellation mod, but it's the Parallax mod. Lord knows last week I had to do loads of retakes for all the bits where I said, oh, this is called the Tessellation mod, guys, and it's the Parallax mod. Anyway, we're just going to perform our uh, burn back to Kerbin. So we've got to do two things. First of all, obviously, lower our periapsis to intersect Kerbin's atmosphere, but also make sure that we're not going to be entering on an inclined orbit. Not that it really matters, but it makes it much easier to get back to the Kerbal Space Center's runway if you're coming in from an equatorial orbit. But don't worry guys, I do appreciate that most of the stuff I've done in this video thus far hasn't been particularly difficult, so I'm going to try and make things harder for myself right now. We're not going to use the nuclear engine or the rapier engines again, ever, for the rest of this video. Uh, I'm going to get back to the Kerbal Space Center's runway entirely using aero braking and flying and gliding. Uh, we're going to do it all without engine power and rely solely on the atmosphere to get us back to the Kerbal Space Center's runway. So do make sure you stick around. I know people tend to start clicking off when the mission's all wrapped up. So there you go. There's something for viewer retention right there. Uh, you can stay around and see, see how I do it. I mean, I think you can probably guess how I do it, but nonetheless, I think it's still going to be interesting to watch, I hope. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. So there's Bob doing, is uh, getting all the science that he needs to get from the science bay. I know we don't need to take the data from the science container because this is an SSTO at the end of the day, so the entire thing is going to get recovered, but I don't know. I guess, A, I'm used to, like, storing experiments into a cockpit, and it just wouldn't be right, you know? The cargo bay is not pressurized like the cockpits are, so we would risk contaminating our scientific samples if they were left in the unpressurized cargo bay. So we'd be better off putting them inside a nice, safe interior space, so that, that I thought that would be a sensible place to store our experiments, basically. Now I'm going with a fairly conservative aero brake altitude, only about 55 kilometers above the surface of Kerbin. We could go a lot lower and, you know, effectively speed up the process it's going to take to lower our Kerbin apoapsis, but this is much safer, you know, we don't want anything to overheat just in case, particularly those air brake components. Those are very, very fragile to heating, somewhat ironically. So I'm just going to, that's why the footage is playing back so fast, just this part of the video doesn't drag on too long. Was that a pun? Drag on because we're doing Aero brake maneuvers, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, it was at this point I realized that we can probably get to the Kerbal Space Center from here, so I didn't need to coast back to orbit. We can just glide through the atmosphere and we can accept this as our final atmospheric re-entry in which we're not going to come back into space from. And it's just going to be a case now of coasting towards the Kerbal Space Center. So I clicked on the little buildings on the map screen and pressed activate navigation just so I know what to aim for. But uh, it was a little bit difficult, actually, because I'm so used to approaching the Kerbal Space Center's runway during the day that I kind of just rely on looking at the landmarks, like the mountains, the various peninsulas on the approach, to kind of figure out where I am and how much aero braking I need or what kind of speed I should be doing. But because we're flying at night, where everything's really dark, obviously, I've, it was really difficult, actually. Well, it was like, it was more difficult than I was expecting. I was like, well, is it? I don't really know where I am which happens to me a lot in real life. <laughs> I don't know where I am, so I'm just going to have to sort of hope and pray. But luckily, guys, the thoughts and prayers, they came through, and we got to the space center, no problems. And there is the runway there. Now, I don't know if I'm going to bump up the brightness. Well, you know, I will have already done this for you guys because you've been watching me fly at night for a while. I don't know if I'm going to bump up the brightness just because I am aware that nighttime scenes on YouTube look very, very dark because of the way YouTube compresses videos. I don't know, but if the video looks very bright, uh, that's why it's because I bumped up the brightness. But again, I, I don't know if I am. I think I might just upload the video and see how it looks. And if it looks terrible, I'll re-upload it. Here we are, the brakes were a little bit powerful on this craft. We slowed down a bit faster than I would have liked. I was hoping we could come to a nice slow coast down to a standstill, but the brakes had other things in mind. I think I set them to be very, very powerful. When we landed on the mud, I didn't want us to slide about. Hence, we had a fairly dramatic finish when we touched down on the runway, but that's pretty much the video done. We could do one sort of final spin around shot of the SSTO, get a good look at it before we fade across 
to an end screen. In fact, before we do that, we need to see how much science we unlocked. Goodness me, how could I forget? And there we are, 1,567 science units. I'd say that's not too shabby for this mission. And there we are, an end screen, finally. Uh, left hand side is a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm based on your viewing habits. The right hand side is a video that's it's just my most recent upload, whatever that may be. Uh, description has things, as I'm sure you know, that's how descriptions work. And uh, that's the end of the video. Goodbye. <laughs>